Welcome to Hope with Jonathan. I'm Jonathan Trailer, a kidney transplant recipient. Based on my near-death experience with kidney failure, we now spotlight kidney patient story, giving them a platform to express their personal journey with battling kidney disease, kidney failure, dialysis, waiting for kidney transplant, and much more. We share stories of hope right here on the Hope with Jonathan podcast. Hope with Jonathan podcast is a Hope Media production. Never let hope become a memory. Hope with Jonathan podcast is a Hope Media production. Appreciate you guys tuning in, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring on my friend, uh, kidney advocate, organ donation ambassador. He he's got an incredible story, so I'm going to let him uh, share for most of the rest of the time of this podcast. Um, so here we go. Without further ado, uh, all the way from England, Fezawan. Hey, Fez, welcome to the show. Hi, how you doing, Jonathan? You all right? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, Fez, I'm sorry. I apologize. I made a mistake. I thought you were from London. So please tell us, please uh, educate me on where you're from. It's all right. Um, everyone just assumes if you're from England, you're from London. Um, <laughs> I actually live in the northwest of England, um, close to the city of Manchester um, in the county of Lancashire. Um, so that's where I'm actually from. Okay. Okay. Good. Good to know. Good to know. So, yeah, I had a D. Uh, D. Moore, the Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast, and she's actually from Birmingham. Okay. Uh, so, Birmingham here in the states is uh, a city that is in, I believe, Alabama. Uh, so, uh, when you say Birmingham here, that's what everybody thinks. So, yeah, I, I think it's kind of a preconceived notion that everybody from England is from London. Or at least from the general area. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, forgive me for that. Forgive me no, for that. It's, cool. it's all right. It happens. So, so, Fez, welcome to the show, and I uh, appreciate you doing the uh, podcast with us. It's a bit late over there. What is it, around ten o'clock? Yeah. 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 It's about ten p.m. now, roughly. Just a little past. Yeah. So, so why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us just a little bit about you, and then we'll get into your kidney disease story. Um, okay, so I'm Fez. Uh, I am now 36 years young. Um, I was born with renal failure. Um, yeah, and I guess that's where it all started for me, pretty much day dot. Um, I do a lot of volunteering here in the United Kingdom, so with NHSBT, uh, which is NHS Blood and Transplant as an organ donation ambassador um, with Kidney Research UK. I'm part of their um, I'm a community ambassador for them. Um, I'm also part of their research network. 
um, for NHS England and improvement. I'm a peer leader, so I help and support people um, going through the NHS and the different pathways within, within the NHS. Um, also locally, I'm part of a group called R Plan, which is Renal Patient Led Advisory Network. And we help with quality control, putting the patient's points of view across um, to help services within the Northwest, which is where I'm based, as mentioned earlier. Um, I also recently started with an Instagram group. Well, it initially started as an Instagram group um, called Chronically Brown. Um, so that group is predominantly for South Asian community who have chronic illnesses, whatever that illness may be. Um, and I help and support that as well and as an ambassador um yeah. so fingers in lots of pies yeah it sounds like i i've seen you 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 have like quite a uh, extensive list of different um places that you're uh or you know ambassador for and volunteering and, and doing things like that so uh it's really incredible uh what you do and uh i've heard you talk and speak on uh, clubhouse and uh, so we had we hadn't actually ever met in person, so it was really a, a great thing for us to be able to actually see each other and uh, meet each other uh, at least uh, virtually. <laughs> yeah, maybe one day in person. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll get across the pond, as they say. <laughs> yeah. So, so Fez, uh, you have a really really uh, interesting story. So you were basically uh, since childbirth, you've pretty much been uh, suffering with with kidney disease and, and kidney failure. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so a lot of the early years, it's more kind of stories I've been told by my parents, sure, um, and aunts and uncles and things that were there at the time and that can remember things that happened. Um, so yeah, I guess at the beginning, I wasn't really good at keeping food down. So I was nasogastically fed. Um, so that's a tube up your nose down to your stomach. Mm -hmm. Um, I had problems urinating. So my initial diagnosis was reflux. Um, so instead of my urine emptying like normal, um, the urine kept going back to my kidneys and eventually they went kaput. So yeah, that's how that happened. Okay, the background just freaked me out a bit. Sorry. Um, yeah, so that's how that happened. Um, yeah, and kind of, I guess my parents were in and out of hospital with me for quite a many number of years. Um, so when I was three years old, um, and it was actually April Fool's Day when we got the call, um, my dad initially picked up um, and he thought it was a prank call. So he hung up on the hospital. Um, Fortunately, they did ring back, and this time my mother picked up, um, and she was like, this is not a joke, we should take him into the hospital. Um, so when I was three years old is when I received my first kidney transplant. Um, things were good, they were all right. Um, I did have further urine issues because of the reflux. My bladder had swollen up and become quite large. Um, so around approximately the age of, I guess, eight maybe even seven um i had my native kidneys removed um because it was thought that they were causing a lot of ur urinary tract infections mm -hmm. um also at the time i had to catheterize to make sure i was emptying my bladder properly um because after a couple of scans and a couple of tests um the normal way of passing urine wasn't doing the job sufficiently so i had to start to catheterize as well just to make sure i was emptying my bladder properly um at what age did that start? Um, so I probably started catheterizing eight, nine years old, roughly. Approximately. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible, man. That's because, you know, that can be quite painful. And I'm speaking from a uh, personal experience. I remember I had a urinary tract infection that really was bad. And they, they wanted me to start uh, doing the self catheterization. And uh, even as a man, uh, a grown man, it was quite painful for me to do that. Um, I don't know if as a child or maybe, maybe it wasn't painful for you, but it was quite uncomfortable to, to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world to do admittedly. Yeah. Um, so the catheters I had, um, so initially I was doing intermittent self-catheterization. Um, so ISC as they kind of 
shortened it for me to make mm -hmm. it easier. Um, so I would do that kind of every four hours. So the catheters I was using, um, if you put them in water first, it kind of lubricated them. Okay. But it made it a bit easier to kind of pass, so to speak. Um, but even with the kind of lubricant, um, it was quite painful the first couple of times. Um, right. But I knew I had to persist because otherwise yeah. I would empty the urine in my bladder um, and I'd get more UTIs and keep any yeah. And so forth. Yeah, because you have to reach the bladder. You have to go, you know, through and and go all the way to the pierce the bladder with that, and it, it can be quite uncomfortable. Yeah, um, I think once my system got used to the catheter being passed, um, it wasn't as painful. Um, it was still a little bit weird as a yeah. sensation, I guess. Um, but I guess the pain aspect of it kind of died away as my system yeah. got used to having this catheter pass yeah. through my body. Um, but yeah, um, so I had to kind of deal with that. And I guess because I was in primary school at the time, um, I guess that's when I kind of noticed I was different to other kids. Because um, yeah. I didn't see no other children passing tubes to urinate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think True. that's when I first was like, oh, okay, no one else does this, but I do this. Right. Um, so that's when, yeah, I kind of noticed, okay, there's something different with me rather than everyone else. Yeah. And how, how was that? Because, you know, kids can be mean. I mean, they can be terribly mean. <laughs> um, they can. Um, admittedly, there was the name calling and, you know, um, it, was a, it wasn't very inventive name calling. Um, also, because I had my transplant, I was on certain medications, which made my hair grow quite rapidly um, for a person who was kind of eight, nine years old. Um, so things, you know, like Teen Wolf, for example, or Captain Caveman, that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. That's yeah. that's terrible. So you had a you had early uh, facial hair and, and things like that already coming in. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot more facial hair than a general normal eight, nine-year-old boy would probably have, to be fair. Right. Um, so it was it was visible that yeah. I had facial hair. Yeah. Um, and that was due to medications. And I had much bushier eyebrows mm -hmm. at the time as well. Um, so, yeah, it kind of made me stick out a bit visually as well as having to kind of leave class to catheterize and having to use the staff bathroom as opposed to the student bathroom. Um, so all these kind of things the other kids would, you know, notice. Yeah. Um, there was at a point when I wasn't intermittently doing it, but I had to have the bag at the same time. So it was continuously draining. Um, so carrying that around in school again also not the greatest thing um so yeah there were a few things here and there um i guess thinking back on it now it seems a lot bigger in my head when i kind of think about oh yeah i did that and i did that and i did that and i went through this um but at the time i just went with it um yeah. it kind of didn't really process at the time i guess now i'm a bit older and i can process these things and i was like yeah that was kind of okay that was what bullying was and this is the effects afterwards and i still think about it now and again um but yeah i mean it is what it is it was what it was um yeah. and i'm not in that position anymore and it's at this age now it's normal to have facial hair so i'm good um, yeah so yeah uh, um so, so you eventually ended up, though, in uh, complete renal failure, and you had to have a transplant. At what age did you have your first transplant? Um, so I had my first transplant when I was three. Wow. Yeah. Three years old. Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine, yeah, your, your parents had to kind of help uh, tell you exactly what was going on, unless you, you don't remember that at three years old, do you? Um, no. So, again, as mentioned earlier, um, I don't remember it. Um, yeah. So it's mainly a lot of stories my parents have told me and the elders that were around at the time. Was it a, I'm guessing it was a, a pediatric size, a, a, a child, a child's kidney, or was it? A, a I do believe so. Okay. I, be, I believe it was a child who passed away. Yeah. Yeah. And then did you, ex, you had to experience dialysis at that age as well? 
Um, so I believe I was on dialysis, but for a very short time before we got the call. So it may have been like a month or so, potentially yeah. two. Um, but yeah, it wasn't for very long. Um, and I guess I was very fortunate in that sense um, that we did receive the call when we received it. And thankfully, my mom picked up the second time because my dad thought it was a prank the first time. Oh, so yeah, that was that's amazing. Thing. So... I'm get. I'm assuming that that was probably hemodialysis that you did as a child, maybe. Um, no. So um, oh. it was peritoneal. Um, okay. So PD. Um, so I think they had inserted the catheter, and I probably did a month or so, um, of exchanges at home. Um, I was also still getting nasogastrically fed, so I didn't actually eat solid food till I had my first transplant. Um, so the first three years pretty much of my life everything was tube fed um, and all measured out and kind of fluid restricted and very balanced um, so yeah a lot of the heavy lifting in the early days was done by my parents to be fair um, so I'm very grateful for that because without them I potentially would not be here what did what did they define your your kidney failure was from what 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 disease or what what I mean, was it just because you were born with some uh, genetic issues, or was there what um, was it? What was the disease? So it was due to reflux. To the reflux. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, because of the reflux, but there was nothing. So because of that, uh, what was there any sort of um, like uh, you you know uh, something down there that it, it wasn't developed quite properly did they ever figure that out or, or um so everything was developed um so the issue was at the point of my bladder where the urine would release there was extra i guess tissue uh -huh. um, so people generally would urinate normally um but because i had these extra pieces of tissue the the urine wouldn't release mm-hmm um, so it had no way of leaving my system. And if there was no way of exiting, it just went back to the kidneys and it yeah. just kept this vicious cycle. And yeah. that's how my kidneys got damaged to the point where they pretty much failed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for explaining that to us. Cause I was, uh, I've, I've heard of reflux and things like that, but I wasn't exactly sure if maybe there was like a blockage down there or, or some sort of, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess the extra bits of tissue so to speak um i guess was a growth that shouldn't be there i mean they did try to operate when i was very very young um probably a couple of weeks old um but the surgeon's hands were too big and i was too tiny um so they couldn't rectify the issue um wow so yeah it was little things like that uh, yeah. or big things depending on which way you look at it um that kind of caused it to get worse and worse and worse and they tried other things um so but unfortunately none of them were kind of successful really to be honest um and it eventually just made my kidneys go up so, so you had the first uh transplant how long did that transplant last you so that transplant lasted about 10 years so i was in high school at the time um yeah so i was about 13 roughly maybe 12 12 13 approximately um and i started to feel a bit unwell um and because i had a bit of a track record with utis um we just assumed it was another uti to be honest um went to the hospital kind of said look he's not feeling too great um by now i had collected many traveler miles with the hospital and they kind of knew me and my family quite well um and at first, they thought it was a UTI also, mm -hmm. um, but then when they did some blood work and they found out certain results, you know, creatinine and GFR and things like that, um, they had quite drastically changed. Um, and they thought, obviously, it was a bit more serious. Um, I ended up having a biopsy. Um, I ended up staying in longer than I thought I was going to stay in. Um, and they were like, yeah, this kidney's kind of, on its way out and he may have to have dialysis which i ended up having to have um so because previously when i was very very young um i didn't have pd for very long 
Um, so I was fortunate enough that I could still have PD this time. Uh -huh. So yeah, I started PD. Um, initially, I started doing exchanges for a very short time because it was impractical, um, taking kind of the equipment into school and doing oh, all that. Sure. Stuff. Yeah, so very uh, quickly. Uh, and then back to, uh, you know, teenage years and adolescence and uh, puberty. And uh, uh, so probably uh, d how did it affect you as far as a teenage and, uh, you know, and, and starting to notice changes in your body and, and uh, opposite sex and all that stuff? I mean, was there an issue with uh, that type of stuff? I mean, I don't have a great track record with the opposite sex generally. <laughs> um i was more concentrating on being healthy and staying alive um yeah. and oh, just totally. being as healthy as possible um but yeah i guess it was very strange because i would miss a lot of schooling um and this was during my kind of secondary exam so during gcse years um initially as mentioned i was doing exchanges at first but this was impractical um, so my parents and myself had a chat with our renal team, um, and they told us about APD, so automated peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started doing automated peritoneal dialysis. Um, and I guess that worked out better for me. Um, so even though I was doing like 12 hours a night, um, for six nights a week, um, so I would go onto the machine kind of 7 p.m. So I would be ready to get off the machine at 7 a.m. to be ready to go to school. Um, so if there were like social events, um, if friends were meeting up for birthdays, if friends were going to the cinema, if they were just going out to play footy even, um, I wouldn't go. Um, mainly because I probably didn't have the energy, to be honest, because um, yeah. it was completely like it just drains you as you probably not um yeah, also absolutely. because i had to be connected to a machine so yeah. um i missed a lot of the social aspect i guess um which is it is what it is um it sucked at the time um it wasn't great um but i also think it helped me get into my other hobbies which i really enjoy like comic books um so yeah i mean pros and cons i guess I didn't get to hang out with people, but yeah. I escaped in other ways um, via comic books and other things like that. So how long did you have to continue with uh, peritoneal dialysis or um, at nighttime until you got your second transplant? So I was probably on peritoneal dialysis in one form or another for about two years approximately. Mm -hmm. Um during that time, um, because it was affecting my schooling so much, um, my father volunteered to be a live donor to myself. Oh. So he was also going through the process of the live donation process mm -hmm. um, whilst I was still dialyzing. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of got the okay and the clear that my dad is okay to be um, a donor. Um, and the date was set and we kind of had a target of getting a second transplant from my father that's awesome that is that is beautiful uh that your father uh stepped up to 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 do that and uh be be your donor that's that's incredible and and he was a match yeah i mean yeah he proved he was my dad <laughs> so, yeah. um, he was a match thankfully yeah um, so yeah um that was great um, yeah and i'm forever grateful for that opportunity um but yeah, so I received my second transplant um, in the year 2000 um, on Star Wars Day. Um, so that will be <laughs> my Millennium Transplant forevermore. Um, oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's really um, cool. So yeah, that's when I received my father's kidney. Um, so and, I he, guess, and, and you thrived with that transplant for, for a good while? Um. It was a bit shaky to begin with, to be honest. Um, so the first maybe 12 to 18 months were quite shaky. Um, I had a few episodes of rejection, um, which were counteracted by changing my medicines, um, giving me IV drugs. Um, 
I also ended up getting meningitis. Mm -hmm. um, I also ended up getting encephalitis. Um, I also ended up getting CMV. Um, Ooh, so it, it wasn't the easiest of rides. And again, this was kind of GCSE years. So, and because I had missed so much schooling, um, there was a point where I was literally going to examinations with cannulas in my hand because I had to go straight back to the hospital for more treatment. Um, so examinations didn't go very well either, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I guess it affected my schooling quite badly, um, which is something I kind of regret, but I guess also something I can't really change. Um, I did as much as I could with the circumstances I was dealt with. Um, so yeah, the first kind of 12 months, 18 months weren't the easiest ride, so to speak. Um, so yeah, it was an all plain sailing, unfortunately. And then uh, you ultimately ended up facing rejection again. Uh, and, and what year was that? Oh, wow. Um, so I probably had my dad's transplant about 12 years. So by this time, I had finished college. I, I did well enough to get into college, thankfully. Um, finished college, did quite well in college. Um, had a few UTIs throughout that. Um, but again, by this point, I had got quite used to having UTIs. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a massive kind of burden, I guess. Um, yeah. It still caused issues and I still had to, you know, have antibiotics and it still would sting when I pee, etc. Oh, yeah. Um, but I had been through worse things by then. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I enrolled into university. I went to do, you know, more education. And what? during the second year of university, I started to feel unwell. It initially started with just like sniffles and a bit of a cough. Yeah. And I thought it'll pass in a bit. It'll be okay. I mean, I knew I was kind of immune suppressed anyway. So I'm going to pick things up as it is. Um, and I just thought it was just a lingering cough or a bit of a cold. Um, and it'll last a bit longer for me, but it'll be fine. It won't yeah. be a problem. Um, I was terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, it lasted much longer. It got much worse. Um, I ended up getting cramps. Um, I was exiting out of all holes. Um, I wasn't keeping food down. Um, I was missing lectures. Um, it got to the point where my housemates rang my parents um, and they were like, he's really not well. Um, and maybe you should come and check on him just to see, you know, if he's okay or if there's something that needs to be done. Um, I was a I was younger then. Um, and I was kind of, I don't know, I guess a young man in it wanted to kind of prove that I can do this by myself. I can have that independence and live with this illness and be okay. Sure. Um, I guess we all learn lessons in life. Um, my parents did turn up at the door. They told me I looked very pale, almost like a Simpsons character. Um, I think when you hear that from your parents, you know, you might be in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I ended up, um, they ended up taking me to my hospital that I was under at the time. Um, again, blood tests, urine tests, et cetera, were done. My creatinine had shot up to just under a thousand. So it was like 900 and some of um, my GFR had plummeted quite rapidly, quite low. Um, I was admitted, I was given emergency hemodialysis this time with a shunt in my femoral, in my leg. Um, I was on IV antibiotics um, and I was admitted for quite a few weeks, maybe two, maybe three. Um, and in essence, they basically said the function that has been lost can unfortunately not be regained. Um, and the remaining function that you do have will slowly reduce to a point where you will need dialysis again and you will need a third transplant again. Yeah. Um, so in 2013, um, I was preemptively put back on the transplant list. Okay. Um, so being from an ethnic minority, already having two transplants, 
um, finding a donor match was going to be fairly difficult. Yeah. Um, so generally here, um, ethnic patients tend to wait approximately a year longer than their Caucasian counterparts. Sure. Um, I had the extra complications of already having two transplants. So my antibody count was quite high. If you don't um, mind, Fez, would you share your uh, lineage or? Um... Sure. Yeah. Um, so my parents are from Pakistan. Okay. Um, I was born and raised here in England, um, okay. in the in the northwest, in God's great country of Lancashire. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, um, that's my lineage, I guess. Okay, that's yeah. great. I just didn't want to keep people guessing of what you know what I mean. So I was glad. I mean, we could have turned it into a game and see if someone commented and got it. <laughs> we I could mean, have we done could that. With people for a bit. <laughs> we um, could have done that. Um, but yeah, so. Um, generally, um, and, ethnic... and let me, let me ask you this real quick. So when you went through the, uh, you had to do the, the emergency dialysis with a shunt in your leg, uh, when you left hospital and you, you said preemptively, you were put on the transplant list where you, uh, did you immediately go back to the, uh, peritoneal dialysis for home treatment? No. So what initially happened is they managed to salvage some of the function. Uh huh. Um, so I wasn't at the point of needing dialysis. Okay. Um, the the shunt itself could only stay in a week um, because of infection control risks. Um, right. Because of where it was. Makes sense. Um, I was still on IV medications. So like the second week slash third week. I, I've, honestly, that part of my life is a little bit fuzzy. Um. Oh, it's understandable. Mainly because A, it was a long time ago, and B, so much stuff happened so quickly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it was either two weeks or three weeks I was admitted. Um, so, but the the emergency dialysis itself probably lasted a week. So maybe I had four sessions potentially. Um, but the IV medication would carry on. Um, but yeah, at the end of that, they kind of said, the function that you have remaining will keep you going for a little while longer, but it will eventually kind of decrease to the point where you are going to need dialysis again, and you are going to need a third transplant again. Um, and because of my ethnicity and because of my other complications of being transplanted twice, I was preemptively put back on the transplant list, um, even before I had started dialysis, um, because they knew it was going to be quite a bit of a weight for myself sure and did uh antibodies uh play a role because of the uh other transplant lost yeah so that was one of the other factors that you know kind of had to be put into consideration when preemptively putting me back on the list um because i had quite a high antibody count um from i guess the transplants but also all the other things that had been through in my life yeah. um my antibody count was quite high um so it seemed like a very sensible logical idea to um preemptively put me back on the list absolutely um, yeah so you ended up uh eventually the second transplant obviously ended up failing eventually like they had told you or warned you that that was going to eventually happen and you so at that point you were able to receive a third transplant once you tell us a little bit about that yeah um so before the third transplant i did actually end up going back on dialysis mm -hmm. um i guess 2014 maybe mm -hmm. 2015 um so initially again um this time it was a uh, hemodialysis um so i had a fistula created um and initially I was going in center, um, but that really didn't last very long. Um, I was probably at the time, one of the youngest patients turning up to do my dialysis. Um, yeah. It kind of felt a little bit alienating. Um, everyone always already kind of had their kind of group that they chatted to and got along with. And here came this young guy. Um, right who was kind of on their patch, so to speak. Um, and it was just strange. And I was young and I wanted to do stuff. And because I had left uni and I hadn't officially qualified and I'd left early, um, 
I got into quite a dark kind of way of thinking of what am I going to do with my life now. Sure. Um, and I really wasn't sure. I kind of turned into a hermit, really. Um, I wouldn't talk to people. I really wouldn't go out that much. I would stay mm -hmm. in bed quite a lot. Um, and yeah, in, in center can be uh, sort of depressing, uh, yeah. especially when uh, I, I kind of faced the same thing because I was one of the youngest patients in my uh, center as well. And uh, mo the morale in there was really low. And most of the patients had already just given up and accepted that this was their life and this was how things mm -hmm. were. And um, I started thinking differently and I had other thoughts that there's got to be a better way to do this. And um, so I, I really didn't want to accept it anymore. And, and I, I did home hemo as well. So I'm, I'm guessing that you, you ended up moving back to uh, home dialysis as well. Yeah. So that's what eventually happened. So again, had a word with my renal team who were really supportive at this point i was in adults now um and yeah they were really supportive with it they kind of understood that i was still quite young i still wanted to do things um and i still wanted to have that quality of life and sure. because our co-production worked really well with the staff and myself and having those conversations um i ended up training to be a home dialysis patient um, so I went through all that procedure, kind of learning about the machine, how to use it safely, how to place my needles safely, how to remove them safely, um, what to do in an emergency, God forbid, if something did happen. Um, so, yeah, I guess my training was about six weeks in total. Um, I think like the first two weeks, to be honest, I probably slept through. Yeah. Because my body was still adjusting to dialysis itself. Um on the way back on taxis and stuff, I would just fall asleep. Um, wow. But yeah, so the first couple of weeks, I probably didn't even process much information I was getting told. Um, but yeah, then I ended up at home. Um, and then I started researching and learning about nocturnal dialysis and how that could be even better for myself and to improve my quality of life. Um, mm -hmm. This is when I also started volunteering a lot. Um, in different kind of organizations, initially as a youth worker. Um, so I got my youth work qualifications. So um, that kind of put my mind at ease that, okay, I've, I've got that at least. Um, I'm yeah. able to do that. And I'm, that's a field of work I can go into. Right. Um, but then, yeah, I started doing nocturnal. Um, unfortunately, my fistula failed. Um, so I ended up with a CVC line, so a central venous catheter in my um, neck here. Um, and I probably did nocturnal for about four years, maybe. It was coming up to, I think, about five years. Um, so I'd gotten into a routine. My quality of life was as good as I could possibly make it. Um, my blood results at this point were, were, I was told, as good as a transplant patient. So maybe I don't need to dialyze as many hours. Um, but I was like, cool, if, it, if it's doing its job, let, let's carry on. I'm just sleeping anyway. Right. Um, and then in July 2020, so during the pandemic, um, I got the phone call from a hospital to say there's a potential third kidney available. Uh -huh. um, I didn't actually know that the transplant system had started to roll up on again um, because we were in a pandemic. I thought it was still closed down, um, but evidently not. Um, and I was very fortunate in towards the end of July 2020 is when I received my third transplant, which I affectionately call my pandemic transplant. That's that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, I was transplanted in uh, August of uh, 2020. Uh, so um, I, I, I sort of experienced the not in the height of COVID, but it was, uh, you know, a few months later and um I basically had to go in the hospital uh, by myself. My wife was, I had to leave her uh, at the uh, front entrance. They let her come in a little bit. And then they said, you can't go any further. And I, yeah. I had to go in there and, and, and do everything by myself. It was, it was quite uh, interesting, but um, I was going to go through it no matter what alone with a lot of people. It didn't matter. I wanted to get the transplant. So and uh, I wasn't scared about COVID at all. I said, no, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Now, some patients uh, were uh, really nervous, I think, about that aspect of uh, being transplanted during that time. But I, I, the risk uh, 
or the uh, the reward far uh, was greater than than the risk, I, I believe. Yeah. So obviously, I was tested before my transplant to make sure I was negative regarding COVID, yeah. Um, yeah. and so was the donor. Um, but yeah, everything was explained. The ward that they had started the process on again was strictly just for transplant patients. So mm -hmm. obviously, no visitors, etc. Right. Um, and it, they were very kind of strict with that um, to the point if my family wanted to bring anything and it would be quite a journey because I lived like an hour, maybe slightly more in traffic away from where the transplant was happening, the mm -hmm. hospital where it was happening. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been a bit of a trek for them to come constantly. Um, but we communicated via Zoom and things like that. So um, it kind of helped. Um, and I guess because I was an adult, I kind of had my own kind of like Netflix and things like that. So I had enough stuff to kind of keep me occupied. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah, it was strange. It was weird. I was already isolating anyway um, before the transplant. And then right. afterwards, after the transplant, they were like, you know, you're going to need to isolate. And I was like, that's not I mean, a problem. I've already been doing it. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So you were already used to that. And then. You know, in recovery anyway, they're giving you like pain medication and you're nodding out for a couple of hours and you're coming back, you know, and you're in and out. So you would you wouldn't be any good to any guest anyway. So it wouldn't really matter <laughs> if anyone was yeah. in the room. Uh, so with the pain medications and stuff that they give you. Um, yeah. So. So, you know, I noticed you're really active and you talked about you started volunteering. Um what 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 why are you so passionate obviously you know your story but what 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 makes you so passionate about being involved with all of this uh, advocacy that you're involved in um i just want to help other people more than anything else um there is the aspect of it of trying to you know fight health inequalities for um communities um that are more ethnically challenged let's say um but yeah i think trying to get equality and um just making sure people don't have to kind of suffer and not be knowledgeable in their journeys when it comes to kidney illness um or kidney disease um to know that there is support out there there are people out there that have had similar journeys um and to help and support them through whether that be young people like myself who started very young um and help them through um, whether it's the transitional phase of being from pediatrics to adults, like I've been through that process as well, um, to all sorts of patients, really. Um, but especially with ethnic minorities, I think we do need to talk about it more. Um, we do need more awareness about it in our communities to make it less of a taboo subject to talk about um, because kidney disease does not discriminate regardless of your gender, or your race or your sexuality or whatever um if you're going to suffer you're going to suffer um yes and try and promote i guess prevention as well so through education try and get people to prevent their function um to getting to the point where they have to start going on this merry-go-round of dialysis transplant dialysis transplant um yeah i think also educating the general public as well that transplant is not a cure um, is probably the best form of treatment that we can get, um, but it's not a cure. Um, it's called a chronic illness for a reason, because it's chronic and it's for our lives. Um, so getting people to accept that and kind of learn those basic things is a massive help to the chronic community. Um, and especially with um, people from ethnic minorities who just generally need to have that conversation a lot more. No, I, I agree with you totally. I mean, we need so much uh, awareness for um, not only kidney disease, but organ donation as well and uh, fair treatment of uh, patients across the board, regardless of uh, eth ethnicity and, and sexual orientation, all that stuff. Uh, we just need to be fair across the board on, on all of that. And um, I, I, I applaud you for everything that you're doing. You're pretty active in the uh, social media uh arena with uh like clubhouse i see i hear you on clubhouse <laughs> i get to hear you on clubhouse yeah <laughs> so uh i 
I do think that it's uh, an amazing thing. You have an, an incredible story and uh, history with uh, kidney disease and uh, kidney failure. I mean, um, you're you're a kidney kidney fighter, uh, and you got a lot of you got a lot of fight in you, Feds. Thank you very much, Jonathan. <laughs> It's uh, been an incredible podcast, a lot of great information shared. Uh, I really appreciate everybody that showed up tonight and uh, supported us uh, or this afternoon for Fez. It's getting pretty late, so I don't want to keep him too uh, too long. Really appreciate uh, Jonathan Bartley. He said he's from London. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan, for uh, supporting the show tonight. And uh, Kyle Hockridge is uh, sending you a message on behalf of all the those kidney uh, disease and kidney failure. Uh, on this World Kidney Day 2022, thank you both for the work that you do and the time you put in uh, straight from the heart. Uh, bless you both. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kyle. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Jonathan, from London for turning up. We know each other. Um, okay. I say that. Um, but yeah, he's a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, cool. And I love him very much, platonically. Well, yeah. that's great. You know, support support is crucial when you're battling a yeah. chronic chronic illness, and uh, whether you're a dialysis patient or you're a even a kidney transplant. Like you said, kidney transplant doesn't mean that it's over. Like, oh, the disease is over. It's a treatment. It's a treatment for this. And uh, you know, and Fez is uh, he's a testament of uh, what what can happen. And uh, you've been you you've really been blessed. You know, with the uh, you've been able to get you know, three kidney transplants, uh, which is amazing. So uh, the good Lord above uh, still has a plan for you, uh, Fez, uh, obviously. I hope so. I hope it's a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is because you're utilizing your story for the greater good. And yeah. um, obviously you said you just want to help people, which is yeah. amazing. Any any shout outs you want to give before we end our podcast? Um, Jonathan, thank you for turning up. Um, I think peer support is very important also. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk about that. But I think having a group of friends or fellow patients or um, even carers, that you can learn so much from carers as well. Um, it's amazing to have these groups of people get in touch, keep in touch. Um, because I noticed, for me at least, when I went through these highlights of failure and then waiting for transplant and dialysis, a lot of your peer group tend to disappear because you're out of sight, you're out of mind, um, right. whether that have been in high school or university or college, et cetera, for myself. Mm -hmm. um, so people like Jonathan, people like Hilaria, who has men, who has commented, um, she's commented under her group name, which is WSH BME Kidney Network. Um, so people like that and Kyle as well, and yourself who I keep in touch with on uh, Clubhouse, um, it's great to have a community of peers that I can talk to, um, whether it be here in the United Kingdom, and now it's even bleeding across the pond to the United States. Um, I've even met a couple of, I'm not met, but I've talked to a couple of patients in Holland as well. Um, so it's amazing like meeting all these people who have this illness. Um, and it's a great support for me, but I also in turn want to be a great support for them. Um, and I guess that's why I do it. And it's important, I think, to have that peer group to support and lean on and kind of talk to when no one else really understands, but other patients get it. Like you can talk about something really random and everyone else will be like, what are you on about? But other people will get it. Like I could have a conversation about catheterization with Jonathan. He would understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Whereas if it was another friend from my street, they'd be like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. It's gross. Let's not talk about that exactly no it's it's great to find that uh common bond and uh be able to share that with someone you know that that understands uh what you're going through uh and you're right like if you mention uh having to self catheterize or, or uh, dialysis uh you know people they just don't they don't get it you know they just don't grasp that so it's it's amazing that you have those kind of friends and um i really appreciate you doing the show man uh, again thank you for having me no, it's an honor. It's an honor to have you. And um, I look forward to, to doing more things like this with you. And uh, uh, where, can, where can people find you if they want to find you? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> so on Instagram and on Facebook, it's Fezawan. Um, 
I'm not that hard to find. On Twitter, it's at Fezzy. So it's Fez with a Y at the end. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not difficult. Um, I would also, before we do leave, say, please have the conversation with your loved ones and your family regarding organ donation. Please make them aware of your wishes, um, whatever your wishes may be. Um, so they are respected at the end of the day when it comes to the day of your passing. Um, so please have those conversations, whether you start with your family. Um, you may want to do it in places of education if you feel comfortable or at work, etc. But please definitely start having those conversations regarding organ donation. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think on that note, we're going to close out the show and that, let that be the final statement of the show is uh, have, have those conversations. Uh, before you uh, make those plans and have those conversations with your loved ones and definitely uh, sign up to be a donor. Uh, you can do that at donatelife.net. Uh, that's, that's for here. I believe in the States and it, it may not, I don't think that's worldwide. Uh, is there a website maybe possibly in the UK that, that supports organ donation you want to share? Um, I believe it's organ donation UK. Okay. I believe um, I can Google it quickly. Um, but I don't know it by heart. It's like 10 o'clock at night, to be totally honest. So <laughs> yeah, I got it. you. I got um, you. It's organdonation.nhs.uk. Okay. Thank you very Post much. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that with us. And thanks again for being on the show. Hey, guys, really appreciate all the support. Y'all take care. God bless. Take, you, take care of your kidneys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, here it is. Hey guys, have you been over to hopewithjonathan.com? You can actually listen to the audio podcast, watch live streaming interviews, purchase merch to help support Hope with Jonathan podcast, read blogs, and much, much more. For more information on this, go check out hopewithjonathan.com where we share stories of hope. guys have you checked out kidney conversations a new series brought to you by host hope with jonathan and kwm's kidney warrior merch kyle hawkers from toronto canada yes it's a brand new series brought to you by us for you as the kidney patient we're trying to inform educate and inspire by sharing and spreading awareness for kidney disease dialysis kidney failure transplant organ donation and so much more this is a brand new series guys brought to you by hope with jonathan and kidney warrior merch what we're going to do is post weekly on our pages across social media right now it's facebook instagram and twitter 
And then on Friday, we'll be releasing an informative video over on Hope with Jonathan. Check it out, guys. Kidneyconversations.info.